All right. Quickly, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I promise it will be applicable. So I'm curious, why is starting something new seem to be so difficult for us as human beings? Just quickly, why? Afraid, fear of failure. Anyone else talk about that? Fear of failure. Absolutely. What else? Outside your comfort zone. Like, we love being uncomfortable, right? Our whole culture is built around being uncomfortable. I definitely don't live in a moment in a time where everyone is deserving of comfort all the time, right? It's uncomfortable. Why else? Why else? It's, it's, it's sometimes hard doing something you've never done before, or sometimes you try to do it and it doesn't work. Yeah. Yes, habits and bad habits in particular, are they difficult to break? Yes, only if you're a human being, but the rest of us, it's really easy. So go. There's not enough time to do the things that we're already doing. Life already feels full. Nice. Yes. When we make a change in your life, in our life, is everything disrupted? Yes. Like no human, small humans to small humans. Life disruption, right? Job change, right? Taking something out of your life, adding something in, right? It affects every piece of it. Today, as we jump into our passage, last week, as we worked through, God spoke and gave a call to the people of God to accomplish a purpose. And today, they have to decide how they're going to respond. I'm going to say this is one of those moments that's not a cautionary tale in Scripture, right? Not everything that everyone does in the Bible is good. So don't play Bible roulette and just open your Bible and out of context because you'll get some crazy things, right? This is one of those moments where we want to emulate and learn from the way in which they go about responding to God's call. So I'm going to give us some quick context and I'm going to blast through this. So the book of Joshua was written about 1400 years before the life of Jesus. So somewhere between 1300 and 1500 BC this happened and the author of the book is the person whose title is claimed in it. It's Joshua. And the book begins actually five, four, five books earlier in Genesis chapter 12. When God promises to a man named Abraham, if he will leave everything that he knows and follow him, he will be the person that God uses to bring blessing to the nations. And he promises to give his descendants a homeland. Joshua, this man who wrote this book and led the people of God, was Moses' closest assistant for more than 40 years. And at this point, I'm just curious, raise your hand if you're uh, 70 or older. And if you're on the fence, you don't have to tell the truth, it's fine. Joshua is most likely in his 80s at this point. At 80, he's taking the mantle of leadership for the first time. So let that sit in. Like, this is an 80-year-old who spent his life for the last 40 years wandering through the desert. South of modern-day Israel. Right? It's, it was a hard life. But even at that point... When God called him, he said yes. Joshua's name, names in the Old Testament, do they matter? Yes, Hebrew, it's a huge deal. It's a culture where names meant everything. It means God saves, God delivers. And I'm sure you know Joshua by its Greek name, which is Jesus. Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew word named Yeshua, God saves. And in this book, we see God's salvation and deliverance evident in the midst of the people. And in the first half, we discover that God calls his people three times to be strong and courageous. Why might you need to be strong and courageous? Because things are going to be difficult and terrifying, right? I need strength and courage when I'm afraid and things are about to get difficult. So God starts off this book with this clarion call to be strong and courageous because I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. You're mine. I'm yours. I'm giving you this land as an inheritance. All you have to do is just follow me. He doesn't lay out the plan for how it's going to happen. He just says, 
I'm with you, and that's enough of a plan. Will you follow? I don't know about you, but when God speaks or I know there's something more wondrous to do in my life, getting started is the hardest part, yes? Right? That hump of giving started. And we're going to see right here the people of God hear from God, get a vision from God, hear their purpose, and then they start. And I want to encourage you, may this today be an encouragement to you, to the things in your life and my life and us as a church where God's saying go, that we wouldn't go. Because what can we do if we wait? We think ourselves out of any good idea. Every good idea and everything God speaks of, if we send it to committee or if we send it to ourselves and think about it or pray about it, right? Often we'll think ourselves out of the good things that God's doing. And we're going to see a framework today on how to respond as individuals and as a community when God beckons us to follow him. So I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to read our passage, and we're going to learn from God. And God's going to beckon each of us today to new life as we follow him. Jesus, we're so grateful for Joshua, that he lived a life that modeled your salvation. Lord, we pray today as we open your word, that our hearts and our minds and our lives might be changed, that we might not just be hearers of your word, but that it would make that long trip from our ears and our minds to our hearts, that we might live differently, that we might start the things you're calling us to start. Maybe walk in faith as we follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 to 18. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are going to pass over this Jordan to go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan, but all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them. Until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has, has to you, and they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God has given them, then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, to the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave to you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command them shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. I want to just quickly back in that same group, and I just want you to share one or two things that jumped out as you heard that. I'm not asking you to give a sermon, right? Just one or two things that jumped out as you heard the response of God's people to go into the land that he called them to. Go for it. You got one minute. Back to your groups. All right, next person's chance to, chance to talk. All 
All right, let's do this. Sorry, nice and short. All right, so we start out in verse 10. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people. And we hear that and we're like, who's he talking about? So, so what he's talking about is back in Numbers 11, in verses 16 and 17, if you want to pop over, I'm just going to spend a minute there. I'm going to explain who these people are and what their purpose was, because that is a very significant statement who we gathered. Here's what happens. Here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them stake their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you, and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone." Right, So these officers that he gathered are the people in the community who loved and served and took care of and met the spiritual and tangible needs of the people of God in this journey through the desert. They were the people who served alongside Moses in that burden of leadership. For those of you who have been in leadership in some capacity in your life, is leadership a bit of a burden sometimes? Like, to be responsible for hundreds of thousands of people, does that sound like fun to you, right? I have no idea why anyone would do something like that, right? But that's what Moses was doing at this point, and God saw it fit that one person should not lead all. So God elevated these 70 men to come alongside Moses, and they function for us as we look back today and as we see the progression of Scripture as like a proto-elder or a proto-deacon, right? They were, they were like proto, like a prototype, the one that came before, right? They were the people who made sure that when the people of God had questions or needs or something was going on, they shared the burden of the leadership with Moses to meet those needs. And those are the people that Joshua calls upon when it's time for the people of God to start moving, when God beckoned them to follow. Here we see a system of decentralized leadership develop. I'm just gonna, I know no one's ever experienced this, but imagine being somewhere where one person had to make the decision for hundreds of thousands of people. How well do you think that would go? Like, I don't know, I, we may have seen that in a country where people make decisions for other people. It tends not to work really great. Decentralized leadership is the way of Jesus' kingdom. We're going to see it throughout the New Testament, that in the Bible we see this picture of singular headship, but shared leadership among the people of God. We see here a decentralized leadership model emerge here with Joshua as he empowers these leaders to lead, because leaders need to lead. That's what they're made to do. That's what they're called to do. That's what these people were set aside to do. So as Moses wants to move forward, he first, Moses, Joshua, wants to move forward. He gets the leaders, the ministry leaders, the deacons, the elders, the people who there's trust with and says, here's what we're doing. Here's where we're going. We see in the first half of this chapter that God has spoken and his will is exceedingly clear. And the people must be ready to obey. And that always starts with leadership. And as Joshua tells them to prepare to be ready, because God said go, by God's grace, the people follow. It was true for them and it's true for us today that as a church, we go as far as leaders are willing to go as they risk to follow Jesus. I'm just going to take a quick aside. And I'm going to say, to be honest, I find Joshua's response incredibly challenging as a leader. If God said, go and do something like take over this massive amount of land, is anyone else wanting to like get together with a group of people to make a plan other than me? Right. I've got like plans on top of my plans on top of my plans as a human being, right? None of them ever come true, right? But they're there nonetheless, right? He doesn't call a meeting to attempt to make a strategic, like a clear strategy and a clear picture for over the next seven years. They're going to go city by city to take over the promised land. He doesn't form a committee with all the different stakeholders in the community so that everyone has an equal vote in how to do it. 
Instead, he tells people, pack up, gear up. It's time to follow Jesus. Right? It's this huge faith and this huge risk as a leader. And as he takes a risk with God, God is faithful. I'm going to say, may we, as followers of Jesus, learn about the short distance between God speaking and his obedience. May we move that fast when God speaks to us and beckons us to follow him. He goes then and then addresses these three tribes, and I'm going to give you just a quick explanation of what's going on there. Because the Israelites knew they needed every man, woman, and child in the community to execute and play the essential part that they played. Just like us today, every man, woman, and child here is required to accomplish And these hundreds of thousands of Israelites had chosen to settle and gotten permission on the other side of the Jordan. So here's a quick explanation. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses, Moses earlier on granted their request to stay on that side and to stake their claim on this side of the Jordan. And to not enter the land of promise in Canaan. Right? Manasseh asked for the land east of the Sea of Galilee, right? Gad asked for everything east of the Jordan, right? And then Reuben was in the land of Moab, which we, if you've read Ruth, you've heard a bit about how that turns out as they don't join the rest of the people in the promised land. And Moses granted the request. And what Joshua does in this next section, let's, let's read it together. Let's pick it up in verse 12. And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember. This is one of those words that's spoken all over the Old Testament. Remember, remember, remember. Why in difficult moments do we need to remember, church? Why do we need to remember when things are hard? Right? So we can actually do it. Right? If we remember that God's faithful in the past, is it a little easier to take a risk in a new thing in the future? Absolutely. So he starts out and says, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. These tribes had made a promise to the rest of the community and to the people that they would help them conquer the lands as the rest of Israel had helped them conquer the ones that they had settled in. Joshua here calls the people of God to fulfill their call and their purpose to encourage uh, them to start moving when God calls. The people of God were ready. They just needed to be reminded of their purpose and their mission. And I, I'm going to say, like, we're going to see how they respond, and it's, it's wonderful, right? Often when Moses asks people to do something, they whined and complained and said, I don't want to. Or like built an idol to a cow or something weird like that. Or said, we were better off as slaves back in Egypt, right? But this is one of the moments where they actually get it right. And, and I'm going to say, this is risky. So uh, I need you to know, this is when they, when they end up crossing the Jordan a few chapters later, it's 40,000 men of these families that lead the people of God across into the promised land right? That, that God moved in this challenge. And, and I'm going to say sometimes for us, I, I'll, speak, I'll say for myself, often for me, I will not do the, the things that I know God's calling me to do. Sometimes I need a bit of a kick in the butt uh, in, in, a, in a nice way, not like in a mean way, right? But for someone to remind me of my purpose and my mission and my call and who God has created me to be. There's something wonderful about someone who actually likes you. Now, if you're mean, don't do this because you're not helpful, right? 
But, but if you remind someone what God made them to do when you do it in a loving, encouraging, and strengthening way, is it a blessing when someone does that for you? Like, it's such a gift. Is it risky to do it? <laughs> Very risky to do it. Because <laughs> people love when you encourage them to do things. Yeah. Or they do. That's not true. All right. I just, I just want to say, like, Joshua took a pretty significant risk here in front of everyone making that ask. Because they could have been like, nah, I got my land, <laughs> right? I don't want to re- really want to risk the lives of 40,000 of my brothers, of, like, my kinsmen for you. And, I, and it's just this wonderful moment where he took a risk and God showed up in the midst of it. Let's keep working. Verse 16. And they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your word, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not dis- be dismayed. I just, there are so many amazing aspects to their response. Like, he just asked these men to leave their families, leave their livelihoods, and come join and fight the rest of the people. And so I want to focus, and as we finish up, pull out a couple gems from this passage, because there are some things that if as followers of Jesus, we can learn, will not just change our lives and the people around us, but we can be more available to God to be part of the transforming work that God's doing in our city, in our neighborhoods, at our workplaces, and all around us. I'm just going to like do a quick, do you know that God actually wants people to know him more than you do? I just, I just want to throw, that's for free, right? Has to, but like God actually wants people to, okay, if God, okay, God, God, perfect parent, like perfect in love, I'm super not, right? And I want my kids to know and love Jesus and to follow him. I cannot fathom how much a perfect, sinless parent yearns to have his lost children return to him. I, I, I can't even fathom We don't need to convince God to be about his work and mission of transformation. God is doing it and said, I'm already doing it. I'm going. Will you join me? Just like he did for the Israelites. Jesus does that over and over. And the whole New Testament is replete with opportunities and invitations to follow him and go deeper and to join him in what he's doing. We are not asking God to join us in reaching our community right? Since the foundation of this place, God has seen this community, loved this community, and wanted to reveal himself to it, and we just have the incredible blessing to follow him. We're not bringing him anywhere he's not always, already. So I just, whatever. I just want to encourage you with that, because like, this really matters, right? It, no, I'm serious. Like, if God's already done the heavy lifting, and we just get to follow, it changes it right? Because we don't have to control outcomes that way. We just have to control our willingness to be faithful. That's it. All right. The first thing I want to pull out from here is as I heard heard Joshua's words, I can say Jesus, it's the same thing. If I say it, who cares? Same name, right? As, As we see that, they responded in this beautiful picture of Christian unity. So that's the first thing I want to pull out. So unity and conformity are two vastly different words. Unity is moving together for a singular purpose. Unity is a sports team trying to score a goal, right? Or trying to stop a touchdown, right? That's unity. It's a group of people working towards a common purpose. Does everyone agree on everything when we're unified? No, 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 no. That's not how that works. You're unified because you have a common purpose and mission. Conformity is everyone trying to be the same thing. When Paul talks about his church, what's his favorite image he uses over and over again? The human body. He loves the image. God's the head. We're all weird body parts, right? Somehow mashed together to make something wondrous and transform the world. 
right? So unity says you can be a foot, I can be an elbow, right? You can be the spleen, you can be the liver, right? Someone's the appendix. We're glad you're here. We don't know exactly what you're doing, right? Like, like we're all different parts. He's not calling for Christian conformity. He's calling for Christian unity, interdependent relationships focused on a singular purpose and mission of bringing the gospel to the world. And what we see here is a beautiful picture of scriptural unity, not conformity. I'm going to tell you, these people did not agree on everything. They had some different cultural customs, right? They, they had different preferences, right? But even, that, even though that's so, it is possible to have Christian unity with people who you disagree with about some things. And here we see this incredible picture and this commitment to the singular purpose of following Jesus to the place that he's calling them allows them, even though they don't agree about everything, to walk in purpose and mission together. Here we see in Israel the kind of unity as a nation that was essential to fulfill God's calling and promise for them. They overcame the temptation to see other people and their needs as something I don't have to worry about. In a body, if your foot gets an infection, does it affect the rest of the body? It does, right? You could die of a septic infection because you have an infection in your big toe. It takes out the whole thing, right? In Jesus's body, we have concern for other people and view them as important or even more important than ourselves and our preferences. What we see here is an Old Testament expression of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, where the body of Christ is built up of an individual parts that are committed to the well-being of the entire body. All of the parts are doing their work properly. The body is in fit condition. The first thing we pull from their example is this incredible picture of Christian unity, not conformity, right? Because conformity is a delusion and not God's plan. I'm just gonna like throw something out. Did you know God's plan? was that people would leave the garden and spread across the earth. What happens when humans leave the garden and spread across the earth? What do they develop? New languages, new cultures, right? That was God's original intent always, not that we would be the same, but that by the power of God, we could be unified in the midst of being different. And I've spent enough time with people, and you've spent some time with me, that I'm different, right? And you're different, <laughs> right? And we can move in unity because we have a singular purpose. So the first thing I want us to hold on to from here is that every single individual in the community mattered. And if you belong to Jesus, you have a responsibility to own your part in the body of Christ. Because we have no hope of going where God's calling us without everyone being on board. Yet we have zero chance of making it without it. Second, we see this incredible commitment to spiritual courage. Their promise to do what they had been called to do, knowing, not thinking, knowing that there will be a cost that they pay for the good of others. Right? They show courage. Because in the New Testament, we have this beautiful verse that says, No greater love than if man lays down his life. I, I just, there was a guy who did that 2,000 years ago, right? It's kind of the whole centerpiece of the whole gospel is giving up self for others. Do you think some of these people died? They for sure did, right? They gave up their life for something greater. I'm not going to overly harp on that. Jesus said something about giving up your life and finding it and losing it. Their promise to go where they're sent and needed for the good of the kingdom of God advancing in the world, not their preferred will, is a beautiful picture of Christian courage. That for 2,000 years we've watched followers of Jesus walk out in faith, choosing self-sacrifice for the good and for the blessing and the transformation of the people around them. All right, this next one I really don't want to talk about. 
because I feel like it's awkward, but I feel like scripture's really clear on it. So give me some grace if I slightly misspeak on this one. I'm, I'm going for it. The next one is commitment to, to, to scriptural submission. And like, give me a minute. I'm going to tell you, we, do we live in a culture that loves the idea of submission to anyone other than yourself? No. It's literally the most antithetical teaching of the gospel, right, that is deeply offensive to our culture and our moment. They chose to follow people who are following God. Like, scriptural submission is choosing to follow people who are following God themselves. Godly submission willingly submits ourselves to authority greater than our own desires, our own will, and our own preferences, as long as their leadership follows the biblical and scriptural picture of what godly leadership is to submit to. We see in the Trinity itself, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that the Son submits to the, the Father, and the Spirit submits to the will of the Son. Submission isn't bad, right? Submission's really hard because our world's really broken. And often people use power to destroy and distort and exploit other people. But godly submission is a good and beautiful and wondrous thing. Now, submission doesn't mean like someone's in charge of everything and bossy. It's not what that means. It means that there is a mutual concern and a responsibility to love and to serve and for the goodness of the other. We see this in, in the apostles' leadership early on in the book of Acts, where the church chooses to, chooses to follow them. We see this in, in the church creating, at the, closer to the ends of Paul's life, and they create these deacons and elders that lead in the local church, and that church is set aside for the burden and for the leadership of the church. So does this mean you blindly follow anyone in charge? No. We're to measure and compare the leadership in our church and our community to Scripture. And if there's something incongruent, we want to repent and follow Jesus. Because that is the posture of a disciple of Jesus. It's continual repentance, right? I'm going to let you know I'm on the elder team. They're not perfect. They're people like you and me who by God's grace are striving to lead and to love and discern God's voice to lead us where we need to be as a church. It's the same with the deacon team and the ministry leaders as they pour out their heart to serve and encourage and build up the church. And just to let you know, in this church and in Jesus' kingdom, no one's above submission to another. Here at First Baptist Church, I submit myself to the leadership of the elder team and also to Converge, which is our bigger theological grouping of churches, that I don't get to be the pastor if I don't believe Jesus is God, right? If I'm not willing to repent of my sin, if I'm not willing to share the gospel and teach God's word, right? I submit to something greater than myself. The elders and deacons at the church submit to the congregation because guess what? You can't be an elder and deacon unless the congregation, the people of God who call this place home, like, want to submit to your godly leadership in this place. If you want to know what it looks like to live in a world where no one submits to anything but your own desires, go spend three hours on TikTok, Instagram, or Facebook today. You can find out exactly what that looks like. And I'm going to tell you that place is hopeless and destructive and ruins everything. Fourth, the thing we're going to pull from here. I'm so encouraged by their commitment to scriptural blessing and encouragement. I love that they prayed for Joshua, and I think it's so cool. They pray for him, the prayer that he prayed for them, right? He prayed that they would be strong and courageous and that God had spoken, and they returned that blessing. Joshua, as you lead, may you be strong and courageous as you leave. 
I'm going to tell you, when, when you pray a prayer of blessing on someone, like, it's a wonderfully encouraging moment. I think often we pray for people when things are hard, yes? Right? Sometimes, and it's something we see throughout Scripture, is that the people of God choose to bless one another and strengthen and encourage one another in their prayers. They say, we will support you, we will pray for you, we will encourage you, and we will remind you that God is with us even when things get hard. Because if you go back and look, they chose to follow him because they were choosing to follow the Lord, right? Because they believed that he was following God's leadership. And I'm going to say all these things in our natural world sound terrible, right? But because the God-man Jesus came and died on a cross and forgave us of our sins, and God sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to make us a community, and to give us unity of purpose and mission, we can be encouraged that we can follow Jesus into these areas, even the ones that feel really uncomfortable and places where we need courage and places where we need strength. On the night before Jesus gave his life up for us, he prayed this prayer after sharing communion for the first time with his disciples. It's from John 17. He says this, I do not ask these only, for these only, talking about his disciples, but also those who will believe in me through their word. That is us. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. As followers of Jesus, Christian unity is a really, 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 really big deal. If we're polled in five or six or 50 directions, we'll go nowhere quickly. And each month, as we celebrate communion, we're reminded that there is one bread, one body, one blood poured out, one baptism. And at this table, as we take time to remember what Christ has done, we externally and in remembrance testify that we are united with Christ. And because Christ is in us, God can move through us. So I'm going to encourage you as we transition to a time of communion, before you come up, if as you heard God's word today and, and you felt challenged or encouraged or felt like you needed to pray into something a bit, I want to encourage you to not rush up. There's plenty of bread. Right? There's plenty of juice. I want to encourage you to take that space and consider how God is beckoning you to follow him and beckoning us as a church to move in unity, to encourage one another, to pray blessings and encouragement and strength for each other. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful today that you beckon us to this moment. Lord, we're thankful for your invitation to follow you with courage. We pray today as we take this time to pray and this time to remember that you would draw near to us, that we would follow you faithfully all of our days. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Church, the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and be fed.